There's no denying that over the course of 25 plus years, the Sony PlayStation has been a seemingly unstoppable force in the gaming market, with numerous incredible titles ranging from platformers like Crash Bandicoot, to JRPG hits like Final Fantasy and the cult classic Legend of Dragoon, to more modern titles like God of War, Uncharted, and Ratchet and & Clank, along with countless other console exclusive titles spanning four generations, with a fifth one just on the horizon. So it should be no surprise that someone back in the mid-2000s had a brilliant idea. What if we had a game that took all our favorite PlayStation characters throughout the console's history and put them in this battle arena type setting to have them duke it out to see who's the best of the best? And so, after countless years, we finally got the game, PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. A four-player side-scrolling platform beat-em-up featuring all of your favorite PlayStation characters from the PlayStation 1 era all the way to the PlayStation 3. Gamers and non-gamers alike were talking about the game. And their impression? Jesus, was really that bad? Huh. Yeah, well, as you can see, this game didn't have the overwhelmingly positive first impression Sony had hoped for with the world premiere trailer for this game getting 10,000 likes, but just over 7,000 dislikes. Ouch. And soon after, gamers started taking sides and things quickly got salty. So why was this game so hated? Why was the game short-lived? And is there any way that this game can make a Crash Bandicoot style comeback in today's gaming market? Well, let's take a deep dive and find out. So, PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. That mouthful of a name is a title that most gamers haven't heard in a long, long time. It was the game that called itself a Battle Royale long before it was trendy and cool to do so. It's also one of those titles that probably has the most diverse mixed reactions amongst the gaming community that I've ever seen. Depending where or who you mention the game to, you'll have at least 10 or more various responses. You'll have people calling it a terrible Smash clone that was an absolute failure. You'll have people saying that they loved the game, praised it for taking risks, and even believed Sony should take another swing at it with a sequel. You'll also find people who were turned off by the game's mechanics and got a refund at GameStop hours after buying it. There's even those who didn't bother buying the game because characters X, Y, and Z weren't included. It's clear that everyone has their own opinion on the game. Me included. I talked about the game in a video I uploaded called Analyzing the Perfect PlayStation All-Star Sequel Roster. In that video, I go over what I think would be the best variety of characters to be in a new entry for the series, what their in-game movesets would be like, and how they would perform as fighters. Now, I'll admit that the roster in that video was superfluous, and would be a licensing nightmare to develop with several characters barely having any chance of making an appearance. Like Doomguy, for example. Seeing as how weeks after uploading the video, the big news broke out that Xbox purchased Bethesda, pretty much killing the Slayer's chances of being in a sequel. But I discovered something after doing all that research for that video. I found out that I wasn't the only one that absolutely loved the idea of PlayStation All-Stars and how after all these years, with barely any reliable rumors of a new entry on the horizon, there's still a lot of love for this series. Now, PlayStation All-Stars was a fun game that had great potential for growth. However, the game also had some issues that held the title back, and let's be real here, that's undeniable. The game had issues pre-launch which hurt the game's image, along with the public's opinion on the game, and even bigger issues post-launch, which resulted in the game having a disappointing shelf life. So today, I'm going to talk about what went wrong with PlayStation All-Stars, and if they decide to take another swing at the series, toss out some ideas on what they can do to get this game the glory it deserves. So, bit of context here first for those that don't know. I was a big fan of this series back in late 2012. I followed the game closely back when it was first revealed and engaged with the game's community at the time on the game's forums. I even played the game competitively. Honestly, I think I had more hours put into All-Stars than the newest Call of Duty at the time, Black Ops 2. Now, despite how much I loved the game, I also knew deep down that there were some issues with the game that were holding it back. Three issues to be exact. The identical look to Smash Brothers, the game's one-hit KO super meter mechanic, and its slightly disappointing roster. There were other small complaints with the game, but really those three things were the biggest problems that held the game back. So for this video, we're going to focus on these three topics and how they contributed to the overall reception of the game's surprisingly short life cycle. So let's start off with the first thing, which isn't even a problem with the game itself, but rather what hurt the game's image the most. 
I can tell this part is going to turn some of you off and I get it. I really don't want to bring up Smash Brothers when talking about PlayStation All-Stars. But if we're going to figure out why people didn't take this game seriously, we have to look at all the major setbacks that this game had. But yeah, one of PlayStation All-Stars biggest criticisms was that the game looked too much like Smash Brothers. Now, was this an actual problem with the game itself? I mean, not really, but it definitely raised some eyebrows and got people's attention. Some of the people this game attracted were not just PlayStation gamers, but Nintendo ones as well, most notably the Smash Brothers community. And when they heard that Sony was developing a crossover fighting game that could potentially rival Smash Brothers, they really wanted their opinions to be heard. What was the result? Well, over the course of several months after the game was first announced, almost every official PlayStation All-Stars video on YouTube from official trailers to behind the scenes videos had numerous downvotes and comment sections with a decent amount of people saying the same brand of criticisms. It's a clone of Smash Brothers. They're copying Smash Brothers. They're stealing Smash Brothers idea. Now, it's a bit tricky to tell if these people were Smash players defending their game from a potential rival or ordinary gamers pointing out the similarities, but whatever the case, the game was very rarely given a break with this condemnation. It was like an inescapable curse that haunted the game for months and even years to come. Whether it was YouTube comments, forums, basically anywhere people talked about the game, there was a good chance toxicity would follow. Now, I won't go too deep into this topic since over time people have lightened up on the game. But I just want to take a minute to throw my own hat in the ring on this controversy. And I'm probably going to get some flack for saying this, but I feel like this needs to be said. But the people that bought and played PlayStation All-Stars didn't really care that the game was similar to Smash Brothers. Back in 2012, when I was hyped as heck for this game, I knew that this game wasn't an original concept and that it took some pages from Smash. But honestly, I didn't care. In fact, a majority of the people that bought this game didn't care either. I personally connected better with PlayStation's branch of characters on a nostalgic level than I did with Nintendo's. Also, it should be abundantly clear by now after all these years that Super Smash Bros. and PlayStation All-Stars were two different games with different mechanics. It was like comparing apples and oranges, or in a better sense, comparing Call of Duty to Battlefield. What I mean is that yes, both games look similar, the themes of both games are similar as well, and both games are from the same genre, but when you pick up the controller and you actually play both games, you'll see that the two games play completely differently from one another. Super Smash Bros. is a game where you have to beat the snot out of the opposing characters and knock them out of the arena to win. The more damage they take, the further back they fly when you hit them. Simple. With PlayStation All-Stars, characters had no health bars and you didn't win by knocking people off of platforms. Instead, you had to beat the snot out of your opponents to fill up a super meter, which unlocks one of three finishing moves that can one hit kill your opponents. Successfully hit them with this move and you win. Simple. Now, it's been roughly eight years since PlayStation All-Stars was released and I want to ask you guys a real question. Do you think this game deserved the Sony Smash Bros hate it got? I mean, in today's gaming world where we have other platform fighters like Brawlout, Rivals of Ether, and Brawlahalla making the rounds, I think we can agree that while PlayStation All-Stars wasn't an original idea, this criticism of the game being similar to Smash doesn't really matter anymore. I mean, the developers on this game tried to make a different fighting game experience with new mechanics and took risks, and even though the risks didn't pay off in the end, you still gotta give the guys from Superbot points for trying. With all this hate it got, it eventually brought up a question among the community. If Sony decides to make a new All-Stars game, should they make it another platform fighter like the previous game? Or should they go with a more traditional fighting game route like with Tekken or Street Fighter? Or think outside the box and just make a kart racer? Well, here's my personal opinion, and you can disagree with me on this or not, it's fine. But honestly, yes, they should make it another platform brawler. The idea behind PlayStation All-Stars was to make a side-scrolling platform beat-em-up game featuring PlayStation characters from vastly different worlds coming together in this huge worlds collide crossover type spectacle. And it's not just with the characters, you also have this theme that spread over to the stages. Like this one stage in Ratchet and Clank's Metropolis that's peaceful and business as usual. Then things get interrupted by the Hydra from the first God of War game. Or even a happy jolly day in Loco Roco that gets interrupted by a freaking Metal Gear. I mean, this was the game where you could beat up violent edgy characters like Colonel Raddick and Kratos with less serious characters like Parappa the Rapper and Fat Princess. 
That was PlayStation All-Stars identity, and I think they need to expand on what that was in the next game, both with its theme and concept, and just embrace what the game was. Yes, PlayStation All-Stars was not an original idea, we get it, but who cares? Is it really a bad thing to have another platform beat-em-up game in today's world? I mean, I'll be real here, Super Smash Bros. is always going to be the king of platform fighting games. I mean, compared to Brawlhalla and other platform fighters, the game is in a league of its own. But that's fine. PlayStation All-Stars doesn't have to be a game that rivals Smash Bros. It can be its own thing without trying to take Smash Bros. spotlight. Overall, the game was a love letter to the fans of PlayStation that kept the game alive since its inception in 1994. And with the new PlayStation 5 that's almost upon us, there's a new chance for the title to come back and fix the issues that plagued the first game. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that when it comes to the Sony Smash Bros. hoo-ha. I want to switch gears to the actual technical stuff that truly held the game back. And that was with the game's unique but game-ruining one-hit KO ultimate meter. This was the thing that in my opinion hurt the game more than anything else, especially when it came to the game's longevity and appeal to casual gamers. I remember back when the game's hype train was at its peak, and there was a public beta that was released back in September for fans to get a hold of. People got a hold of it, played it, and oh boy, did this get people talking about the game. But the reception for this was more mixed and confused than overall excited. To most gamers, especially the casuals, their impressions on the game were very mixed. You had people that loved it, hated it, but most of them were just confused. People thought to themselves, Okay, so you can't knock people off of platforms. None of the characters have health bars, so how do you even win in this game? What do I do? Well, if you were going into the game with no knowledge on the title, you kinda had to figure that out for yourself. Unless you played the tutorial. To put it simply, the only way you can beat your opponent in this game is by hitting them with your ultimate move. Or your super move, whatever you choose to call it. To get these ultimate moves, you had to beat up your competition which would reward you these energy orbs that fill up your super meter. The more hits you land on them, the faster the meter fills. The meter could also be filled up one of three times. Each time it fills up, you get access to a more powerful attack capable of hitting more opponents at once. Once it's filled up, you push the R2 button to execute your ultimate move, and if you're able to catch your opponent with this move, you knock him out and get 2 points, and the person you knock out loses 1 point. Whoever has the most points within 3 minutes wins. That's how the main mode of the game worked. Now again, I'll give the people from Superbot credit where it's due. They tried their hand at creating a unique fighting game experience, and I gotta give them points for trying to be different. But as someone who was a hardcore PlayStation All-Stars fan, I gotta say that while this super meter mechanic was okay and did provide a unique spin to the fighting game formula, in the long run, it just didn't work out, okay? To casual gamers and even hardcore fighting game veterans alike, these mechanics tainted the overall feel of combat. In other words, matchups didn't have that constant sense of tension that you'd get in practically any other fighting game on the market. Since these ultimate attacks were the only way you can take out your opponent, there were prolonged periods in matches where there really wasn't anything to be on your guard about. Whereas in other fighting games, you gotta constantly stay alert, keep your guard up, and attack when you see an opening. Otherwise, you'll end up in a combo or taking a hit that could cost you the round. In PlayStation All-Stars, however, matchups felt less like an actual fighting game and more like a game of round robin with who can hit the other guy with their super move first, without dodging it. Oh yeah, there's something I forgot to mention earlier. If your opponent just so happens to get out of the way of your ultimate attack, or god forbid you miss, then you gotta refill the super meter and try again. And again, and again, and again, until you eventually hit the son of a gun. Most players had a problem with this because it felt like throwing punches at people didn't matter. Again, comparing this mechanic to other fighting games, when you get hits on your opponent, there's at least this lasting impact you leave on them. They lose a bit of health, they stagger, they get stunned, you freeze them in place, you get the idea. The point is you're slowly chipping away at an opponent and over time getting one step closer to beating them. I know I don't gotta explain this to you guys, but this kind of progressiveness is what makes a fighting game well, a fighting game. However, in PlayStation All-Stars, that competitive edge is barely anywhere to be found. I mean, if you attempt a super move on someone and you missed a shot, then all that progression you went through to build up your super meter felt like it was all for nothing. 
especially in a situation where you beat the living snot out of someone in an online match, hitting them with heavy combos left and right, but they managed to somehow win the game by hitting you one time with their super move. While they were able to dodge your level 1 ultimate attacks like 6 times in a row, it makes you feel like almost all the fighting you did in that match was pointless, despite the fact you were kicking his ass. All that time filling up your meter, missing supers, and then rinsing and repeating the process over and over again over the course of several minutes got people bored of the game much quicker than you think. And then there's the competitive side of All Stars and how the super move mechanic affected the balance of the game. Now, I should note that the game wasn't terribly balanced. You know, before that big patch update came out. I remember kicking butt with or getting my own butt kicked by practically every character on the roster. However, since the only way to get a kill in this game was through these super moves, all the pro players had to figure out was which characters had the best supers and who could get them the quickest. And yeah, you can imagine this didn't take long. Especially when the pros figured out a slight gameplay exploit in the form of kill confirms. In other words, very hard to escape from combos that chained into an ultimate attack. This is why characters like Raiden, Dante, Ratchet and Clank, Kratos, and Sly Cooper were the most commonly seen characters in competitive play. While it was much rarer to find a player that used Sweet Tooth, Sir Daniel, Zeus, or Spike, since their ultimates either had poor range, were easy to avoid, or they had no kill confirm combos. Now, I'm not going to say that the combat in All-Stars was completely terrible because of this mechanic. There were some things that the game did right. In fact, one of PlayStation All-Stars greatest strengths, at least in terms of gameplay, was the game's combo system. I absolutely loved that they gave every character in the game an actual set of multiple combos they could pull off. Another thing about the combo mechanic I gotta give praise for was its burst feature, where if your opponent just so happens to get you in a long, brutal combo you couldn't escape from, at some point a burst would happen, which would send you automatically flying away from your opponent, giving you some breathing room to assess your situation. Honestly, I like this mechanic a lot, since it was essentially a counter to infinite combos and other cheap exploits people would likely use against you. Now, some may say that Superboss should have just said screw it and just went the route of Super Smash Bros. and copied the game point for point, even though the Sony Smash Bros. hate would have likely been much more prevalent at the time. But instead of going the route of Super Smash Bros. and having a game where you just knock people off platforms, Here's a better idea. Imagine the previous PlayStation All-Stars with vast improvements to the game's combat and gameplay, with the added mechanic of characters having varied health pool amounts and damage outputs. So characters like Zeus would be high health, high damage powerhouses, while characters like Sly Cooper would be one of the more fragile characters. Next, add this thin extra layer of Marvel vs. Capcom with the super moves, where instead of one-shot killing players, they take a slight chunk of your health away. Yeah, I know this idea pitch sounds like standard fighting game 101, but this would help the combat feel much less restrictive and appeal better to the casual gamers, while engaging with the hardcore fighting game community. Now I know there's people out there that have different ideas for the next PlayStation All-Stars. This is just my idea on what they can do for the next game, but if you guys have a different idea on what Sony should do with the sequel, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Okay. Now we're on to the third biggest thing to talk about with the game's issues, which is the roster. More importantly, how people were upset that character A, B, and C were in the game, while characters X, Y, and Z didn't show up. A lot of people say this killed the game before it even got out the starting line, and to some extent, they're... Yeah, they're, they're sort of right. I mean, why would anyone buy a game that celebrates the history of PlayStation when a certain character from their childhood didn't show up? Now, in my previous PlayStation All-Stars video, I stated that the roster for the game was decent. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't absolutely fantastic either. And yeah, I still stand by that. There were some characters that were great choices, while there were others that were more questionable. The questionable characters being Fat Princess, Big Daddy, Raiden, Evil Cole McGrath, and the 2013 variation of Dante. That's five characters that people took issue with which, for the record, is about 25% of the base game's roster. Now, a lot of people asked why certain characters didn't show up or were included the way they were. Well, to make a long explanation short, it was mainly due to the unlucky development time of the game. The characters people had a problem with or those they wanted didn't belong to a company owned by PlayStation, but rather separate third-party studios. 
which means it's their call on whether or not their characters show up in the game and it's their call on how the characters are presented. And most of the decisions these studios made were based solely on what was going on in the games industry at the time. For example, Superbot wanted to include Solid Snake and the old school Dante in the last game. What did they get instead? Well, they got Dante, but Capcom demanded that they use his 2013 look that people at the time hated. This was to promote the new Devil May Cry game coming out at the time. Konami, on the other hand, had a new Metal Gear game on the horizon as well, and they wanted their new and improved Raiden in the game to generate notoriety for the new Metal Gear title. In other words, they were corporate controlled promotions. Big Daddy, surprisingly, was a promotion as well. See, originally back in 2011, there were talks about a PlayStation Vita exclusive Bioshock game that was supposedly in development, but was cancelled later on. It's likely the paperwork for Big Daddy's inclusion was already signed, and they had no choice but to go through with it. Now, outside the base game's roster, there was the issue with the highest requested characters for the game. Yes, I get it. People were upset that characters like Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, Sora, and Cloud Strife didn't make it. I mean, they were some of the biggest PlayStation characters from the early PlayStation 1 and 2 eras. It should be a no-brainer that these characters had to be in a game like PlayStation All-Stars. But, like I said, it's not that simple. I mean, most don't know this, but Crash Bandicoot and Spyro unfortunately didn't make it due to Activision demanding a large sum of money for both their inclusions. Money that Superbot simply didn't have the budget to cover. Also, remember how instead of the cool Dante everyone wanted, we got the 2013 Dante because Capcom said so? Well, assuming Superbot were capable of doing the almost near impossible in bringing Spyro into All-Stars, it's highly likely Activision would have demanded they use Spyro's look from Skylanders rather than his old school design. Since in 2011 and 2012, Skylanders was making Activision big bucks, and Activision likely didn't want people to recognize Spyro from what he was in the past, but rather what he was to Activision at the time and to promote Skylanders. So how do you think the internet would have handled Skylanders, Spyro, and All-Stars rather than the old-school Insomniac styled Spyro? Well, <laughs> I don't think you need to be a psychic to know the answer to that question. So personally, I think it's for the best that Spyro never showed up at the time. Now I could go on and on about why each big name character wasn't included in All-Stars, but honestly, I don't think it really matters. Like I said, the game's roster was a victim of poor timing. A lot of the decisions that were made about the roster's decision and how they were presented were based on both timing and the climate of what was going on in the games industry at the time. Put it this way, if the game was instead made in say 2015 as a PlayStation 4 title, it's much more likely we would have gotten Big Boss from Metal Gear Solid 5 along with the old school Dante to promote Devil May Cry 4 Special Edition. We also likely would have gotten Knack, the Bloodborne Hunter, and maybe even Delson Rowe. Also, there were decently requested characters that were in development for the game post-launch, like A from the Oddworld series, Dar from the Legend of Dragoon, Tomba, and surprisingly enough, Ryu Hayabusa from Ninja Gaiden. So if the game was pushed back two years, it's likely we could have gotten these characters in the game as well. I mean, maybe we could have had Ryu, I don't know. Look, it's been eight years since the last PlayStation All-Stars was making the rounds, and within that time, the gaming climate has drastically changed. Crash Bandicoot went from having a couple of cancelled titles and being in a state of limbo, to being back at the top of the gaming industry with three incredibly successful Crash games in a row. The Spyro and Final Fantasy series also had recently successful reboots, so the tension with getting them into a sequel could likely be a bit easier than before. And you know what? Even if PlayStation decides to stay away from current third-party characters with its next game, the company already has access to a good portion of characters they can use. Aside from the characters that were already in the last game, there have been dozens of great PlayStation 4 games since All-Stars released 8 years ago, with characters that would be perfect for a sequel like Aloy, Deacon, Jin Sakai, Knack, the PlayStation VR robot thing Astrobot. There's also the possibility of bringing back the four cancelled DLC characters that were planned for the last game. I mean, maybe they can get Ryu? Who knows? Plus, there's the other PlayStation exclusive characters I talked about in my previous All-Stars video, like Kotaro, The Sorceress, A Toy, Tiger Shark, Razel, Rudy Rough Knight, Joel and Ellie from The Last of Us. Hey, what about the Gran Turismo driver? I would main the hell out of the Gran Turismo driver if he was in the next game. Anyone from the Persona series would be great as well. 
But why stop there? They could also include multiple characters from a single series rather than seemingly sticking to just one. Like with Ratchet and Clank, we could have Dr. Nefarious and Captain Quirk. With Sly Cooper, we could have Carmelita Fox and maybe Bentley. Infamous could bring in Delson, Rowe, and Fetch. Hell, Gravity Rush can have both Cat and Raven fighting side by side. You get the point. PlayStation has the potential to make a fantastic hefty roster with its current list of console exclusives. And I think with a much bigger budget, a bit more love, far better post-launch content support, and all the gameplay fixes and changes I mentioned earlier, we could have a PlayStation All-Stars title that would be an absolute knockout of the park. Okay, we're nearing the end of the video, so I'll just end the video by saying this. I have no idea if we're ever going to get a new PlayStation All-Stars game. Heck, I don't even know if a new game even has a great chance of adding characters like Crash, Spyro, Laura Croft, Cloud, and all of the other big AAA characters we wanted. At the end of the day, it depends if the studio that makes the sequel and the guys who own the rights to said character can strike up a deal. Look, I'm just a guy who was a big fan of this series back in the day and has big hopes that this game one day returns bigger and better than before, and hopefully with a much better overall reception than the last game. Now, while it's been a while that we've last heard anything from the series, there is still hope for it to return. According to an interview of PlayStation President Shui Yoshida from back in mid-2013, he said that while he was impressed with the overall sales for PlayStation All-Stars, he didn't think that the game had the momentum to continue supplying the game with post-launch content or to think about pursuing a sequel. Now, this game was a shock to a lot of people, and it definitely raised some questions. Like, why would Sony shut down the post-launch content of a game that was such a big love letter to the fans just several months after the game was released? People theorized that it had to do with the poor sales the game had in Europe, or the fact the game was poorly advertised, or the lack of Crash Bandicoot, or the lack of support from the big dogs at Sony themselves. But I don't think any of this was the key factor at all. Shuhei Yoshida said in the interview that the game sold well, but he didn't believe that the game had enough momentum at the time to continue adding new characters. Now, after carefully thinking about it and doing some research, I have a theory as to why the game's DLC window was cut short, and I could be wrong on this. But I truly believe that the root cause was the poor decision of giving their first two DLC characters, Cat and Emmett Graves, away for free for a two-week period. That's right. As soon as the first batch of DLC characters came out three months after the game released, you could grab both of these characters for free. And this offer lasted 14 days. Now, while this was a very generous thing to do, what they didn't know was that this would likely come back to bite them later on. See, keep in mind that within three months, players likely moved on to other titles making the rounds like Black Ops 2. So players who stuck around and were still supporting the game grabbed the DLC for free when they had the two week long chance to do so. After that, it went up for the original price of five bucks per fighter. Since it's very likely that an overwhelming majority of players got both characters for free when they had the chance to do so, this meant that the sales numbers for the characters after the two week window was up was likely abysmal. The people at PlayStation HQ likely saw these sales numbers and decided that people weren't interested in the game anymore. So after they were done with Zeus and Isaac Clark, they likely decided to cut their losses, take the money they made, and ran with it. Maybe it was due to the poor sales the game had in Europe, but I really think this is why the game's DLC content was short. Now as for the decision of not pursuing a sequel, he did say never say never. He has mentioned that he would like to return to the series at some point in the future, but with a different game mechanic. <laughs> See? Even Shuhei Yoshida thought the mechanics for this game were meh. So, I don't know. We may see this game return again soon. We'll just have to see what happens. But until then, I'd like to thank you guys so much for watching this, and be sure to hit the subscribe button if you're interested in seeing more content like this. Until next time, peace. Also, a big thank you to Honey Bunny Art for making the incredibly good thumbnail art for this video and the previous video. If you want to see more of their work, I'll include a link to Honey Bunny's DeviantArt account in the description below, so you can check out more of their stuff. Thanks, guys.